Hello, 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 and welcome to the virtual California African American Museum. For those of you I have not yet had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Alexandra Mitchell. I'm delighted to be the manager of education and public programs here at CAM. Uh, we are so excited to be joined today um, by two incredible scholars and artists. We're gathered today to celebrate the opening of CAM's latest exhibition um, featuring one of those artists, Troy Montezmichi, Rock of Eye. Artist Troy Montezmichi and Black Feminist Theories Theorist, excuse me, of visual culture and contemporary art, Tina Camp, will discuss various literal and conceptual borders that are questioned in Montez Michi's work, including boundaries surrounding gender, sexuality, class, and ethnicity. Tina Kant is the Owen F. Walker Professor of Humanities, Modern Culture and Media at Brown University. Kant leads the Black Visualities Initiative at the Colgut Institute for Humanities and is the founding convener of the Practicing Refusal Collective and the Sojourner Project. She is the author of five books, including Image Matters, Archive Photography in the African Diaspora in Europe. Her most recent book, A Black Gaze, was published by MIT Press in 2021. She has held faculty positions at the Technical University of Berlin, the University of California, Santa Cruz, Duke University, and Barnard College. Troy Montez Michi is a collage artist, painter, interdisciplinary installation artist, and sculptor. Michi received his BFA from the University of Texas at El Paso and his MFA from the School of Art at Yale. He has shown work at the New Museum, Studio Museum in Harlem, the Contemporary Arts Museum, Houston, The Shed, and the 2019 Whitney Biennial. A native of El Paso, Texas, he lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. I would like to extend a very big thank you to the show's curators, Rivers Institute founding director and chief curator, Andrea Anderson, Jordan Amakani, curator at Rivers Institute, and Taylor Renee Aldridge, visual arts curator here at CAM. The show runs from tomorrow, February 16th, or today, I should say, when you see this, February 16th until September 4th. So we hope to see you here in the museum very soon to see the show in person, which is really incredible. And without further ado, I'd like to turn the conversation over to Troy and Tina. Oh, dang. <laughs> here he comes, here he comes out from behind the, the curtain. <laughs> hey, Troy, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I am good. I am good. Um, I'm actually a little bit bummed um, because I can't be there with you. Um, but I want to first begin with a huge congratulations um, on the show that I hope to see. Um, but I guess I want to start out with, with that. I want to start out with a question that I've always wanted to ask an artist sort of at the beginning of a show, but I never had the opportunity to ask, which is I want I'd love to hear you talk me through how this show is organized for you, um, how it went from all of the many pieces that have so many different directions um, into congealing into the show that it is. So could you give me a sense of how you're organizing it, what you're trying to solicit in that organization uh, for viewers and visitors? And, and I'm just going to vicariously thrill in that as if I'm walking with you through it. Sure. Um... It's, it's been a little bit different with this exhibition, just considering the amount of time we've been working on it during, during a pandemic. And the way it kind of came about, interestingly enough, was inspired by the book. Um, the book came together first, and it was really um, just, just an important process to see my work in that format, and kind of the, the scrutiny, as you know, that it takes to compile a book. Um, it kind of laid the, the groundwork for what I wanted the viewer to experience in this exhibition. And I really decided to just think about the whole gallery space as an interior, um, mm. one of my works. So in a way, it kind of became a survey of many different works throughout the six years I've been working on the Zoot Suit project. Um, a lot of... Uh, there's floor vinyl that references clothing patterns. There's, this is kind of a funny photo text and it's super high res scans of different close-ups of kind of the archived materials that kind of went into making the larger works. Mm -hmm. Wow, so 
it's I, I love the idea that you know the catalog shapes the show because that's never the case. The catalog is always supposed to be a representation or, or replication of the show. But I do know that COVID has like screwed up everybody's timeline. And it's incredibly impressive that you are able to, to go with it in that way, which, you know, which makes me think about the relationship between the catalog and the work and the show. Um, because the catalog in a lot of ways we talked about this a few months ago. The catalog in some ways to me is this bridge that so much of your work demands to be touched. It demands, or at least it suggests the experience that you would have if you could touch it. And so it is that bridge that we get to, even though there's not the three-dimensionality of the textures that you integrate. Um, there is a way in which it mimics that. So it sounds like there's, you're doing that in the show as well, um, to be able to bridge the, the viewer or the visitor's capacity to actually be in touch with you, be in touch with your work, but also the subjects of that work. For sure. The, the process of the catalog, it, it became a way of just breaking down all of the different fragmentation that occurs in my own process and practice. And it almost became the, the pieces for the exhibition in terms of planning the, the way the room is installed. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about, about some of the works. So one of the things I've been always, I'm always surprised when I see more of your work about the way in which you can, you keep expanding the definition of collage, montage, and assemblage. You keep expanding it. They keep multiplying in your work. And I want to hear about the need to multiply them. <laughs> you make them more and more and more complicated, but you know, you make them three-dimensional. You know, you go from a two-dimensional to a three-dimensional and spatially it's, it, it keeps on getting dimensions. What's that about? It's almost, I mean, it's hard to say. I, I do like to think of collage first and foremost as a way of thinking, and that extends for me beyond just visual art, but musical arts play a part. Um, throughout working on this project, I was really struck by the way I started to think of garment production itself as a collage for a me. Mm -hmm. um, and I've just been lucky in this way or kind of have this impulse or intuition of, of the next phase that needs to happen. And I, I do kind of think about the work in chapters. So the, the first iteration of the Zoot Suit work, which is Fat Cat came to play, was more of an attempt to return to painting, which I can't totally do in a traditional sense, but I was really, into the, the materiality of these collected materials from New York City, from El Paso, just thinking a lot about the, the history of assemblage artists in the American South. And then from there, through the research of camouflage theory, then it kind of led me to the paper weavings mm. and other sculptural elements. You know, the other thing that your work that, that reminds me of, it reminds me of Christina Sharp's work. Um, she talks about something called thinking juxtapositionally. And when she talks about juxtaposition, she says it's the bringing together of unlikely elements to actually suggest ways of thinking, things you would never have thought before. Um, and I think about you doing that, things that we would not have thought by seeing a belt in relationship to a canvas, about seeing different forms of weaving that go up and down and become colossal as opposed to laying flat or cladding bodies. But I think that that is really, is another question I have for you is that the way in which you um, bring the body to life in its absence in the Zoot Suit series is something very similar to you bring the body to life that has disappeared in the cutouts from the erotic magazines. 
why are you, where are you trying to take those bodies? Where are you, what are you trying to do with those bodies in relationship to your viewers? I guess initially when I started the project, I kind of suspended that original body of work. So much of, of my practice had dealt with kind of the more erotic imagery. Mm -hmm. and during that, that time with the crazy election, I was just in shock about just the rhetoric that was used. And I being, being somebody from a border town and having grown up there, there was such a misunderstanding of what that means, mm -hmm. uh, living on the East Coast. So I, I felt it was an urgent call to really make work that would give some type of voice to that experience. Mm -hmm. And as I, I started to work on it, I realized that there was kind of a common thread of, of camouflage. And it, it really kind of hit the root of what I was trying to get at in the sense of, of kind of the, the cutouts with the more erotic collages in that it was this interest in surveillance and a, a particular kind of gaze. Um, with the erotic material, it was particularly the kind of fetishism of, of the black male form. Um, and what, what happens when those tropes are applied consistently through the single body portraiture that's uh, often encountered in kind of the full frontal pose. And in terms of collage with El Paso, I, I started to think a lot about growing up seeing um, desert camo my whole life. Uh, the more I researched the suit, I was really struck by the sense that because there was such a flamboyancy to this kind of dandyism, it was perplexing to kind of the maybe mass cultural viewer. And in, in the same sense, it kind of saw it through there. I mean, when you talk about the borders and growing up on the border and what how that shapes how you see, um, I, of course, immediately think about Gloria Anzaldúa's work, right? And what's always struck me about that, her work is her insistence that the border is a land, the border land, right? That that which so many people see is something of just a, a delineation that they pass through. Some people have to inhabit it. Um, and it seems like that is what you're also doing is that you are making this liminal space of black and brown bodies livable, visible, Right, and that that transition, they cannot simply be transacted around. Um, and so I, I guess that question is going to, how do you see the relationship between bodies and border spaces? It's an interesting question. <laughs> I mean, when I encountered the Anzal Duma book, um, Borderlands, it was kind of the first time that I had read anything that totally understood that experience mm -hmm. and the fact that it even brought in kind of a, a reference to sexuality, uh, the, the complexity of the Spanish language within the state of Texas and variation. Uh, it was just, it was kind of life-changing. And I also loved in the way that it's written that it, it is, it goes back and forth between Spanish and English, which is how I grew up. And it, it really just became this, this talisman that happened halfway through the Zoot Suit practice. Mm. And in, in terms of bodies, I mean, I, I do often think a lot about contour and it, it kind of touches different areas. With the photograph, I'm, I'm struck by kind of the product of the photograph in itself is kind of a record of something that once, once existed, but also knowing the, the borders beyond the confines of the photograph can tell a different story in terms of how it's posed. So, so when I think about the border and um, kind of this idea of contour, I think about how it traces our own bodies. And, and that delineation from a figure in a photograph, or even in terms of drawing, like so much of three-dimensionality can be presented through um, kind of a, a contrasting line and give a sense of depth. But even in print media, um, 
just thinking of the way that value has been applied through the land. And I do think of that a lot in terms of just growing up in a place where you, you see kind of what's, what's determined as the other side on a daily basis. And, and the only thing that divides you is a fence or a river. Mm. Mm. And so you've also, I, I'm remembering that, that wonderful interview or conversation that you had with Brent Hayes Edwards in the book, where you're talking about uh, collage as disruptive. Um, and, and I kept thinking about that and I wanted to ask you, you know, is there also a way in which your use of multiple media and, you know, you move from painting, <laughs> trying to get back there, to photography, to sewing, right? That there's something really both itinerant and disruptive that you're not satisfied with a single medium. Um, are you rebelling against? You know, there are like most people say, you know, I'm a sculptor or I'm a painter <laughs> or I'm a photographer. Like you are disrupting all of those. And I wonder if that also is connected to what it means to grow up on a border and not accept that border not accept these kinds of artificial distinctions. I mean, it's, it's quite amazing to watch your work evolve. Where are you going? I wanna know about that and I wanna know where are you going next? <laughs> I think it is, maybe it's an inherent, inherent rebelliousness, but I do think about, I don't know, just, just growing up, I had never wanted to be defined by kind of these singular definitions and so much of my childhood was spent with drawing. And when I started first painting and with more of like oil paints, I always had to do something to the canvas. I was so interested in collage and sewing early on, but it, it kind of, I don't know, it's what you always say as an artist, it's a journey. Right? And I, I learned things each year, but during the pandemic time with a lot of solitary moments, I realized that I am pretty much a painter, but mixed media. And for so long, I thought that history, just because uh, there's such a weight applied to painting. And I've always enjoyed a more democratic view of materials. So there's, and anything can become material um, and kind of a blurring of what's considered to be high class or low class. And even the sense with, with the magazine, just thinking about this more niche kind of form for a particular kind of audience. And what does that mean to take it out of that content or context and transfer it into a work of art? Mm. I mean, the other thing that, that, I, that I'm so fascinated by is the way in which desire is this theme and thread that goes through your work and the way in which you're able to like animate desire like in two-dimensional materials um, without like, making it about sex, <laughs> right? I just, I find, I find it fabulous that you are able to like get us to feel these kinds of queer attractions. You put us in the middle of them. I always, when I'm looking at your work on, especially on the, um, on the, the erotic um, uh, magazines, I always feel like an interloper and I love it. <laughs> I really do love it. I love the way you make me feel like I'm seeing something I shouldn't be seeing, but I'm also making it up, you know, because I don't see it. You know, there are all these gestures that you do, which I feel like is about a kind of queering of both the materials and the gaze, right? Is that intentional or could you talk about it? Because there is a way in which you make us all queer <laughs> you know, or a, a beautifully queer relationship to these uh these images i mean i think it's intentional but i also when i'm collaging it's almost alchemic so it may just be a product of the actual ingredients <laughs> or the materials but it's when i started working with the imagery there's been so much um narratives around trauma and violence in the black body. And so with the cut, I really had to think about how it was going to be used. And it's not, 
To cut something up isn't always a gesture of violence. So when I think about contemporary collage art of artists right now, so many are thinking about the form as a way of, of speaking towards hybridity or more autonomy. And it, it was a material that I really sat with and was frustrated with for some time because it just felt like it was cliche. It's like you're working with erotic imagery of gay men and you're a queer artist. And, and I, I still do have issues with um, the, the pressures of figuration and with what that means as a, a Black artist. But I think in terms of desire, oh, go ahead. No, no I'm gonna come back to desire. What do you mean you have, you have, diff you have trouble with, it, with figuration? I just wanna hear a little bit more about that. Um, sometimes I feel like there's pressure for artists of color to, to depict, depict the body, um, mm -hmm. the body. And so much, as an artist, I've always been drawn to drawing people and portraiture, but I've also gravitated to many abstract artists because they're, they're still a type of materiality that speaks towards an essence mm -hmm. of the body without showing it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of something I think I, I kind of grapple with in my practice in that it's, it's, I find it enjoyable to look through photographs and archives and, and draw the body, but there also feels like a pressure sometimes that, uh, that it has to be depicted in terms mm -hmm. of a more clear understanding for the viewer. And that's, I think that's what collage kind of does in a way is it complicates what that gaze is or that gesture. And it lets you have it both ways. It lets you have figures and abstraction at the same time, right? Okay, go back to desire. I interrupted you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, maybe it's just the way the material's handled. I, I have to touch everything that I work on. And sometimes I realize that I'm applying my own history to the materials. In what way? It's like for, for the magazine page, so much of it is about finding the magazine. Scenes, um, opening them up to the center for position, choosing ones that I just feel something, uh, mm -hmm. something in that photograph that I can't determine and I set it aside. The other ones that are more easy, those get woven and, and that becomes almost like the substrate of the paper. Mm -hmm. And that, that's one way of touching them. I draw over them, I sew into them, all of the the palette of papers I use, those are all hand painted. It's, it's kind of this continual recycling of, of my own work and time and labor in the studio, but also kind of providing a, a di diverse palette of things. So once, once I know that I've compiled or amassed enough works and it's time to bring them together. Mm. Something you were saying early, earlier, I had been thinking about you because I was teaching this essay, this famous old essay um, by James Sneed on repetition in black culture. And he talks about repetition as in black culture as a cut, right? That repeats something that returns it to the beginning, but the beginning is not the same, <laughs> right? And, um, and Fred Moten actually talks about the cut of music on an image. And what it made me think of in your work is um, what the role of the cut is, right? About quite literally cutting, cutting into. And when you talk about it's a cut that recycles, that brings you back to your work in a different way. I guess it, I'm wondering, um, in such a large show for you, do you is there is there an arc that you're trying to actually show the viewer, and where do, what is that? Where does it start, and where does it end? There, yeah, I guess what I wanted to, to do with this show is it almost felt like a reunion, and That's so much idea. <laughs> <laughs> of the works because they've been created in what I would think chapters. The, like chapter two never really got to meet chapter one. 
in physicality other than in just the, the idea or the premise. And that became kind of the foundation for the next variation, the next move. So kind of walking through the gallery, it, it is kind of amazing to see the repetition of thoughts and ideas and gestures and images um, throughout the six years. E even though you can kind of start to see where new moments happen in terms of the paper weaving and the sewing. I, I really wanted to give the viewer kind of back to my own experience in the desert. It's, it's a place that I miss very often in New York. And there's such an expansiveness, which I find comforting. And I remember often looking at the Franklin Mountains, which kind of you can see throughout the city. And it, it just, for me, it felt so comforting to know that something kind of so, I don't know, monumental had been there for thousands of years. And kind of knowing my own insignificance at the moment was kind of overwhelming. Mm -hmm. so, so space became a gesture to kind of have the viewer really go through each work and kind of um, almost like a, a meditative kind of quality. Mm. And now you've tantalized me. What are the chapters? How would you name the chapters? Um, so the titles are also hard for me. And maybe that's also, it's like, I don't want to define it. Uh, no, just tell me what the threads are that led one chapter and then the next chapter. Because you're talking about them having relationships that you're allowing them to inhabit together. I'm just curious. Yeah, I would say the first one is the Fat Cat Came to Play, which was... Right, right off of two, 2016, it was about assemblage. I had collected materials from El Paso and also worked with a local zoot suit tailor to make a series of uh, zoot suits according to my own measurements. I think that that body of work kind of extended maybe to about 2018, um, 19. And it was, it's kind of interesting because in that beginning phase, I, I knew I was interested in camouflage, but I didn't know what, what it was doing. Because then I was like, is, is the aim to kind of conceal the works? Is it supposed to be a believable camouflage? But the more I kind of thought about disruptive patterning, that kind of circled back to this, this gaze that I was thinking about of, of the zoot suitor themselves wearing this garment, which kind of provided them uh, leverage with a certain kind of dance move, but mm -hmm. also within, within their own community. And, and kind of the, the confusing um, sight that must have been. And in terms of camouflage, or sorry, in terms of disruptive patterning, I thought it was interesting that it was a form of camouflage that is not meant to be invisible. It's highly visible, but the viewer is um, not sure which way. The, the pattern is moving or the, the magnitude of its scale. And that kind of, in a way, I, I kind of imagine that as what it must have been like to see a zoot suitor like in, in their time. I mean, this is still, people still wear zoot suits today, but I often think about like early 30s or 40s when it was more of a jar kind of experience to see somebody not kind of adhering to the conventions of style. And then, from the, what other chapter? From there, it became the paper weaving. Mm -hmm. That was also off of some research, mainly because the, the zoot suit was criminalized due to World War II rationing. And at that moment, it, it kind of became more of the symbol of, of being un unpatriotic, which for me was more of a way of just discriminating against people who often wore the suit, since it was predominantly worn by men and women of color. And there was um, kind of a, a camouflage theorist who developed this paper pulp machine uh, as a way to help send camouflage blankets to troops. So I was kind of interested in the way that 
due to rationing, this artist was still able to kind of create this type of paper-like material that kind of lent itself back to camouflage. Um, and from there, I think the last phase was the sewing. And that was the one I had thought about many times, but I was the most afraid to, <laughs> to venture through because I didn't know if the, the paper could withstand um, the machine. But once, once it occurred, I, I knew it was perfect. And I think it's because it really brought together the, my love of drawing and back to line and contour. Wow. I mean, I'm just, I was just swimming with you while you were talking, <laughs> which is, you know, <laughs> you know, you went from the, you went through the, from the zoot suits to camouflage, um, to pulp, right? So like to like destroying that substance, right? That was, that was cladding people and allowing them to enact a certain kind of rebelliousness. And then that gets criminalized, destroyed, and literally ground up. And then you reconstruct it out of it and then start sewing things together. I mean, it's a beautiful arc, right? Um, of all these different chapters. And I, I really, really love it. I love it. So what's next? <laughs> That's my last, my last question. What is next? Where are you gonna go <laughs> now? The next, I have a, my second solo show at company is opening next week. Mm -hmm. And I've been really excited to really focus my gaze on the image of the Pachuca. Mm -hmm. I read this really interesting book by Catherine S. S. Ramirez called The Woman in the Zoot Suit. And I realized um, how much of, of, of the image of the Mexican-American woman in the suit had been erased. And, mm -hmm kind of, it, it's very hard to find images of women in that time, even the full suit, suit garment. And so now the, the new show is kind of focused on uh, women in the suit. I've returned more to drawing more than I ever have uh, with the works that are here at CAM. And that's kind of, yeah, more sculptures, uh, another really long zipper piece that's 37 feet long. <laughs> oh my gosh I can't wait to see that and I have to just thank you again for both the conversation and the work and mostly for something you just said in the in your last sort of statement or response which is I'm turning my gaze towards thank you for embracing <laughs> a gaze a black gaze <laughs> thank you Incredible. Well, thank you both so much for this insightful and extremely intimate uh, conversation. I really hope that you all, the public, will get to come visit Cam to see the show in person. Um, Tina, we hope to have you here in person as soon as well, hopefully to see the show. Um, Troy, congratulations on the opening of Rock of Eye. Um, we hope that you all have a great rest of your day and we hope to see you soon. Everybody be well. Have a good one.